please be seated. For those of you who may not or may be aware, the All Blacks won last night by one point. Uh, South Africa won, but I don't really care too much about that. God bless you, Murray. Uh, the fact that the All Blacks managed to uh, hold on and um, compose themselves and uh, were able to win doesn't compare to you who are able to compose yourself, get up and get here this morning. God thoroughly bless you this morning as we fellowship together. Um, I've got my daughter Grace here and she's, for those who don't know, she's one of my seven children and she's my favourite. That's what she's asked me to say this morning. Uh, Jill's going to come and share with us briefly. ...the villages of Ethiopia and haunt the eyes of many. Bonnie's malnutrition has led to tuberculosis and now her medication, taken on an empty stomach, is fighting a losing battle. Well, I just want to share very briefly, we're all going through hard times and funds are scarce and, and, and there's lots of demands on, on, on us um, and we've got our own disasters, like people in Wairau are really struggling, but around the world it, there's an awful lot of places that are even worse. And, um, I get the tear fund news, the, the tear fund that works through the churches to, to help people in lots of, who are really struggling around the world. And they say the worst disaster at the moment is Ethiopia, and there are over 20 million people starting to starve. And it's, it's a real disaster place there, and they're really struggling. The churches are really working to feed them, and, I don't know where all the food is coming from, but anyway. But um, Tear Fund have persuaded the government to, um, for, for every dollar that people um, donate to Ethiopia, the government will pay another dollar. So um, they're asking for funds, and if you can't, can't give anything, please pray for them and the people who are working there. And of course that's not the only thing, there's also all the people struggling in Gaza and heaps of other places around the world. So I've just got one or two pamphlets at the back if any of you want to look it up. Jill, thank you. Uh, for those who are able to receive the uh, video online of our services each week, uh, there'll be an attachment to that for this Sunday service to give us more information about what Jill has just shared about. Uh, you may recall that we were part of a, um, uh, a charity organisation which looked to provide support for those in Wairoa. Jill mentioned that this morning about uh, the new devastation there and we are uh, we have been in conversation with families there. Many of them uh, were relocated to a park where they had temporary accommodation. Uh, gradually, the, those families were able to return to their homes, not many. Uh, and with the recent event, all those people who were in that park were uh, affected by the recent floods. Uh, we're also aware of families who had just the week or two prior to the floods finally been able to return to their homes only to be devastated again. Uh, for our uh, small part, we have an opportunity for anyone who would like to uh, donate um, linen uh, or blankets, although I might encourage you to keep your blankets currently uh, with this cold weather, but uh, if you have any linen or blankets that you would like to uh, donate, uh, we are gathering them each week and, and every Friday uh, there is a shipment that we are part of which is taken to Wairoa including water and uh, basic foods, uh, but blankets and linen are one of the most uh, requested uh, items currently. So uh, with that God bless you as we fellowship together this morning. 
Welcome to everybody this morning. We begin with our call to worship. You awaken the sun, O God. You guide us into the new day. Your name, O God, like your praise, sings in every person. You speak your word, O God, to guide us into your kingdom. Your hope, O God, like your joy, echoes in every soul. You guide us to those who are looking for you. Your love, O God, like your name, fills the emptiness of every heart. Our opening prayer, the rumbling of thunder in the distance, the shade of an oak tree in the backyard, the laughter of children splashing in the pool, the stars glittering on a moonless night, all the gifts of the universe fill us with delight in every moment. Great is your imagination, creation's joy. Broken, you touch us to make us whole. Tear-stained, you share our pain and struggles. Gifter of peace, you replace our bitterness with hope. Teacher of gentle words, you transform our unbelief into service. Great is your love, Christ, companion of all people. Making hardened hearts as soft as a baby's breath. Turning stiffened necks so we can see the poor. Placing wandering feet back on the path of discipleship. Great is your compassion, spirit of grace. God in community, holy in one, we lift our prayers to you this morning in praise and wonder. Amen. When we look at the relationships we hope to have with one another and with God, we must admit how broken we are. But as we gather in the presence of God, we are promised forgiveness and healing if we will confess our sins. Please join me as we pray to the one who never ceases to love us. You know how stubborn we can be, holy God. You call us to serve others and we stay in the coolness of our own homes. You should send us to where the hopeless live, but we are reluctant to leave the comfort of our complacency. You would feed us on the peace and joy of your world, but we pull our chairs up to the tables of those who serve false promises. Forgive us, guiding God. Transform our defiance into discipleship and our rejection of others into the resurrection of welcoming all people as sisters and brothers in Christ. Help us to love as faithfully as you have always loved us and send us forth to take the good news of Jesus Christ to everyone we meet. We open our lips and confess our hearts. God hears our words and makes us new, sending, out, sending us out to bring hope and joy to all the world. We hear, hear the, the good, good news. news. We, we believe, believe the, the good, good news. news. We will we live out, out the good, good news. news. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. Our sentence of the day. Of Jesus, many said, What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? We say together the collect, Christ of the new covenant, give us the happiness to share with full measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over all that you give us. Hear this prayer for your name's sake. Amen.
The first reading comes from 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, and then 9 to 10. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all of the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. David then took up residence in the fortress and called it the City of David. He built up the area around it from the terraces inward. And he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise in the city of our God, his holy mountain. Beautiful in its loftiness, the joy of the whole earth, like the heights of Zaphon, is Mount Zion, the city of the great king. God is in her citadels. He has shown himself to be her fortress. When the kings joined forces, when they advanced together, they saw her and were astounded. They fled in terror. Trembling seized them there, pain like that of a woman in labor. You destroyed them like ships of Tarshish, gathered by eastern wind. As we have heard, so we have seen, in the city of the Lord Almighty, in the city of our God, God makes her secure forever. Within your temple, O God, we meditate on your unfailing love. Like your name, O God, your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Mount Zion rejoices. The villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Go around her. Count her towers. Consider well her ramparts. View her citadels that you may tell of them to the next generation. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to the end. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The second reading is taken from the second book of Corinthians, chapter 12, beginning at the second verse. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, 
because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, chapter 6, beginning at the first verse. Praise and glory to God. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did the man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. And Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. This is the Gospel of Christ. Please be seated. This morning, God, we say thank you for the authority of your word. We look now with expectant hearts to hear your word through your Holy Spirit to our hearts, each one. Amen. Last night, Grace and I played a game uh, which is... Uh, about a, a crime that's committed and you are given at several stages uh, different bits of evidence and the idea is to try and figure out who the killer is. Uh, Grace is not here now so I want to let you know that I beat her. There were three stages to this game. The first part was to hear what had taken place. Uh, secondly, it's the reports by the different uh, police and authorities involved. And the third is the um, witness uh, testimonies and a bit of the background of each of these people. 
we began this game by intricately reading through all the evidence. We wanted to be certain that we could make a good decision on who we thought was the culprit in this case. We really just wanted to beat each other, so we wanted to do the very best we could. That changed midway through the game where there's new evidence that's offered and all the people who were suspects, we now had information about them. There was the bartender who had spent time in prison for similar offences. So instantly we then leaped to the conclusion that this must be the one. There was the neighbour who lived 200 metres southwest of where the crime took place and they'd found his identification card in the grass not far from the house. He had been a patient in a psychiatric ward. He had been there for similar offences. Ah, no, he must be the one. Then there was the father who had committed several similar acts and therefore we were now suspecting everyone. The final stage, we were given more information where we learned it was none of those people. In fact, it was the real estate agent who had simply gone to this house to scare the people so that they would sell them his property and then he could sell it and make a fortune with the father. Things went pear-shaped and there was a, an argument and then there was death. Neither of us saw this coming but Grace had figured out the clues because she'd seen in one of the photos provided in the game uh, the father talking to a man in black. Some of the evidence that was given by the surviving victim of this case. All this to highlight the fact that how quickly we were to jump to conclusions of who it might be without actually getting to the end of the story and finding out the fullness of all that was taking place. Our gospel this morning, if you recall last week, Jesus had healed the daughter of Jairus, the uh, synagogue chairman, and also the woman who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years. This gospel begins by saying he's now left that place, Capernaum, and he's returned to his hometown of Nazareth. Nazareth was a town that we could possibly compare to Tudua in terms of size, in terms of life, and in terms of population. A community of about 400 people, they never had a church, they had a very small community where everybody knew everybody. This was the second time that Jesus had returned to Nazareth. The first time uh, you recall was when they wanted to get rid of him and push him over a cliff. Jesus enters this town and he leads the service on the synagogue at the synagogue on the Sabbath, which back then was the Saturday. If we were to uh, look at the Greek interpretation of this gospel, it sheds uh, some more light on all that has taken place. For example, uh, Mark's account of the conversation where it said, isn't this the carpenter? Where in Matthew's account it, it says, wasn't he a carpenter? In the Greek, what it's saying is that everyone knew Jesus because he was their local carpenter, so was his father. Such was the intimacy of their knowledge and relationship with him. As it continues, uh, the Greek also talks about he sends the disciples out 
but actually in Mark's account, it actually says he begins to send the disciples out, highlighting the fact that it's not just the beginning of the church where he sends the disciples out, but he's saying it's a continuation for us today. At the end of this gospel, Jesus says, if you are not welcomed, shake the dust of your feet. This was something familiar to them, those in antiquity at the time, where if there was any offense received by people who gave hospitality to you, you were to shake the dust of your feet. In other words, it was symbolic of uh, releasing anything that they may have caused you to feel or to experience. That's our gospel reading this morning. So I think about that this morning and I think about this gospel where Jesus returns to his own community and people despise him. Who does he think he is? He speaks with authority, but actually he's just Jesus. And they mention his siblings. We know his family and just for your information in the Greek the word used for family member or brother or sister is not half sister or half brother, but full. So these were Jesus' real siblings. Mary was no longer a virgin. We know who he is. We know him because he's been a part of our community. We know everything about him. Who does he think he is? Here in this gospel it says uh, even a prophet is not honoured in his own community. That's what Jesus experienced as he went back and it said that he didn't do any um, uh, miracles except that he did heal a few people. In other words, he didn't do them but it meant that he was still able to do them. He just chose not to do so much in that community. And then he prepares the disciples to go out two by two. Why did he do that? Because he had known and experienced all the conflict of speaking about repentance to many people. So he was looking after the disciples. We're now halfway through Jesus' ministry. He's only got one and a half years of ministry and life ahead of him. And these disciples have followed him all this time. And now Jesus said, it's time for you to go out and speak. If you recall, these disciples were pretty thick in terms of every time that Jesus explained what was going to go on, they never got it. And yet Jesus is sending them out and they are none the wiser than they were at the beginning. And he says to them, I want you to go out and explain about the repentance of sin. So like the disciples, we are people who are sent to share our lives and our hearts with others in order that people would know the uh, gift of repentance and the forgiveness of sin. That just like the disciples, we are none the wiser in terms of we don't have the ability to do all that Jesus was asking of them. You recall, he says, I want you to go without two tunics and without food and to take a staff with you. Uh, by the way, that's why our bishops carry a staff. It comes from this part of the gospel. And in essence, what Jesus was saying is, I want you to go out, but I want you to trust me, not rely on other things. Paul, in his letter to Corinth that we heard this morning read, it says that... Uh, uh, I can go and boast of all that I can do, but yet you give me this um, conflicting part of my life 
that makes things so difficult, God. How can I do this if I have these challenges in my life? Where it's highlighted, it is in your weakness that God's strength is made available in us. But that's not what this gospel is about. It's about the fact that Jesus knew that the disciples were in, unable to uh, have all that was going to be needed for them to do the ministry that was placed upon them. Paul knew that he was never going to be perfect enough to fulfill all that he hoped to do for God. In both situations, Jesus in this gospel and God to uh, the people in Corinth through Paul said essentially the same thing. And I trust this is the message for us this morning. That we are people who are not perfect. And we're people who rely on and who call on the name of God. That we are people who, if we are willing to accept that we are not perfect, in that God can begin to work in us. The thing that God requires most of us is to have a heart of nothing else but love for one another. That's why God continually talks about the greatest gift is love. And that we would be people who don't jump to conclusions by the evidence that we're given before us about certain people and, oh, they've done this, so therefore they must be this. That we would be people who are willing to stand to the long run of the story. This morning in our gospel, I want us to know that we as a parish, that we as a church, God longs for us to be a people who are not going to be condemning of those who are in our own community. People who we may know intimately and not place judgment on one another. That we would be people who would be willing to accept the difference of other people in spite of the fact that they maybe don't measure up to what we think they should be. That we are people who are willing to say prayerfully, God, I am not perfect. And I need you, Father, in my imperfection to give all that I need to trust you in spite of it. In the same way for us as parishioners, God calls us to love one another, not just in the church, not just when we share the peace with one another and say the peace be with you. That we would be reminded that first and foremost, before we consider anyone outside of this church, that we learn to love those of our own community, those of our own church. That we would learn to remember that we are people who are broken and God alone is holy and just and good. What are people going to know when they walk into this church? Is it going to be the way that we sing? Is it going to be the way that we preach? Is it going to be the way that we use technology? None of that will be remembered. More than the experience of whether or not they see and experience the love of God in us. That begins within each of us, within our own hearts. It's something that God knows already that we're not capable of, but he encourages us to walk with him. Even in our imperfections, Paul wrote, I am weak, 
that God would be made strong in me. This morning, I encourage us as a parish that our priority would be that although difficult at times, although challenging at times, the thing that God calls us most as a people, most as a parish, is that we would begin and continue to learn to have a heart that would be open to love, a heart that would be open to face our own differences, that we would have a heart to seek God by seeking his love, by learning to love those in our own community. Amen. We'll have a time of prayer now. I'm going to do it slightly different. I'm going to be praying and there will be pauses for us that we can pray in our hearts as we go through the prayers together as a parish. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, you have taught us that when a two or more are gathered together, you are among us. Your love is with us. So as we pray today, Lord, help us learn to love. We pray for all those that go out into the world to do your work. We pray for those that spread the gospel, spread your word, that those that haven't found your love may receive your love. Lord God, we ask for your hand to be on this world. We ask that you may send the Holy Spirit to be with the leaders of this world. May they learn to rule with love in their hearts for the people and that we all may join together and learn to live peacefully in this world. We pray for all those countries that are in war, in poverty, that are struggling with issues. Father, you have gifted those that look after our land. We pray for them that they may continue to look after our land and the world so that many more generations can see your beauty. They may see your love in creation. We pray for those that have tended to the land to feed us, that work the land, we pray for them, Lord, that they may continue their great work in looking after the nations. Heavenly Father, you sent Jesus to be in a family. We ask that you bless our families, bless those that are close to us, that are in our hearts. When Jesus walked into Nazareth and they didn't want to know him, yet he was still there for his family. He knew the love that a family needs and he passed that love on. May we learn to love our families, our friends, our neighbors in the same way that you love us. Heavenly Father, we have those that look after us in emergency services. We ask that you may be with them when things are tough and difficult, when things are not meant to be and they step up and they just stand in and do their work in whatever it may be. We ask that you be with them. We also pray for those that are in trouble or sorrow, need or sickness or have substance abuse, we pray for them as well, Lord. 
we ask that you may put your healing touch on them that they may feel your healing love heavenly father we praise and thank you for those that have gone before us those that have done good works those that have been there for us in times of difficulty or teaching us lessons we ask that they may be risen in glory and that you are there with them we remember all those that have gone before us heavenly father take our hardened hearts and renew them with a new gift of your love so that we may go out and love in the world and pass your love to one another we lift up all these prayers in our savior jesus name Amen.